أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيبي إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم ويسألونك عن ذي القرنين قل سأتلو عليكم منه ذكرا إنا مكنا له في الأرض وآتيناه من كل شيء سببا فأتبع سببا صدق الله العلي العظيم Last night for the brothers and sisters that were with us or maybe they followed us on YouTube and they heard last night's lecture on YouTube, we talked about the story of Dhul Qarnayn. And Dhul Qarnayn was amongst the questions that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked. For those who were with us for the past two weeks, we examined the verses that begin with yas'alunak they ask you rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked about a variety of topics some legal some social some historical this was one of the historical topics that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi was asked about dhul qarnayn last night we mentioned regarding the character of dhul qarnayn who exactly is he as a historic figure alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah Historically, who is he? We mentioned three main theories. The first theory is that he is Alexander the Great, the famous Macedonian king, the son of King Philip, who ruled the East and the West, a very well-known individual in history, a historical individual. And perhaps this might be the most popular theory, that Dhul Qarnayn is Alexander the Great. But if you remember yesterday, I had my reservations on this theory and I felt that if the historical depictions of Alexander the Great are true, then he cannot be Dhul Qarnayn. This was one theory. Another theory was that he's a king from Yemen, a well-known king in Yemen who built the, the dam of Ma'rib, as we will talk about. The third and most recent theory and we said that Ayatollah Nasr Makarim Shirazi holds this theory, is that Dhul Qarnayn is Kurush, the, fi- the famous king, the Iranian Persian king, Kurush, known as Cyrus the Great. These are the theories. There might be other theories out there. But yesterday I said, let's see what Ahl al-Bayt have to say. Because we have a hadith by Ahl al-Bayt who tell us who Dhul Qarnayn is. For example, we have a hadith by Amir al muminin alayhi salam. He says, he was asked, إِنَّهُ سُؤْلَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ أَنَبِيًّا كَانَ أَمْ مَلِكَ He was asked, was Dhul Qarnayn a prophet or a king? He said, neither. لَا نَبِيًّا وَلَا مَلِكَ بَلْ عَبْدٌ أَحَبَّ اللَّهَ فَأَحَبَّهُ اللَّهِ Rather, he was a servant who loved Allah so Allah loved him back. وَنَصَحَ لِلَّهِ فَنَصَحَ لَهُ وَبَعَثَهُ إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَضَرَبُوهُ عَلَىٰ قَرْنِهِ الْأَيْمَنِ Allah sent him to his people. They hid him on the right side of his head. فَغَابَ عَنْهُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهَ أَنْ يَغِيبُ And then he disappeared for a certain period. ثُمَّ بَعَثَهُ الثانية. Allah sent him again to his people. فَضَرَبُوهُ عَلَىٰ قَرْنِهِ الْأَيْسَرِ this time they hid him on the left side of his head. Now hid him is this literal to be taken literally that they hid him on his head, on the left side of his head, or does it have a metaphoric meaning? It's not very clear. Again, he disappeared a second time after being hit on his left side. And then Allah returned him to his people again, a third time, فَمَكَّنَ اللَّهُ فَلْمَكَّنَ اللَّهُ لَهُ الْأَرْضَ And then, Allah established him on earth. He gave him rulership and he made him powerful on earth. وَفِيكُمْ مِثْلُهُ And you, Muslims, 
have someone similar to the Qarnayn. And the hadith, at the end, it says, يعني نفسه. The commentary, the commentator on the hadith, he says, يعني نفسه. He meant himself. Amir al-Mu'mineen was speaking about himself. So we have a couple of narrations, very similar, that Dhul Qarnayn was not a prophet, was not a king. This is a hadith that I recited was by Imam Ali. There's another hadith by Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, that Dhul Qarnayn was hit on his right side of the head, so he disappeared for 500 years. And then he, re he returned, he was hit on the left side of his head, he disappeared for another 500 years. And then he returned, and then he owned the east and the west. This is another hadith. Another hadith, which is a bit contradictory, which is a bit con uh, uh, contradictory to the previous hadith, the Imam says that out of the 124,000 prophets, only four of them were kings. Prophets and kings at the same time. لم يبعث إن الله لم يبعث أنبياء ملوكا في الأرض إلا أربعة. Out of all of the prophets, none of them were kings except four. إلا أربعة بعد نوح. And all of them they came after نوح. أولهم ذو القرنين. So in this hadith, the hadith tells us that he was a king and a prophet. While the other hadith told us he was neither a king nor a prophet, but this hadith tells us he was both. وَإِسْمُهُ عَيَّاشُ His real name is Ayash. This is the first prophet king. وَدَاوُودُ وَسُلَيْمَانُ وَيُوسُفُ These four individuals were both prophets and kings. فَأَمَّا عَيَّاشُ فَمَلَكَ مَا بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ As for Ayash, who is Dhul Qarnayn, he owned whatever is in between the east and the west. Meaning he practically owned the entire earth. Owned as in rulership. His rulership, his kingdom was over the entire earth. And so on and so forth. He's, he speaks about the rest of the prophets. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So this is one issue I wanted to discuss. Another is, why is he called Dhul Qarnayn? Qarn, literally in Arabic, means what? A horn. Dhul Qarnayn means... A person who has two horns. Qarn literally means a horn. So why was he called Dhul Qarnayn? Here there are a couple of explanations. One explanation says that Qarn here has nothing to do with a horn. Qarnayn it actually means the east and the west. The rising part of the sun and the sunset of the sun. The rising and the setting of the sun. Qarnay al-Shams. And because he owned, he ruled the east and the west, he was called Dhul Qarnayn. This is one explanation. Another explanation says, because he ruled for two centuries. And a Qarn in Arabic, it could mean a horn, it could also mean a century. A century. So he ruled for two centuries. But how long were each century, it's not very clear. Today, when we say a century, we mean 100 years. Does that mean that he ruled for 200 years? It's not very clear. Another explanation says that he had two horns on his head. Two horns sticking out of his head. Hence, he was called Dhul Qarnayn. The fourth explanation and the most logical explanation is that he wore a helmet. His crown had two horns. You see, the helmet that he would wear in, during wars, in a battle, when he would travel with his army, the crown that he would wear, it had two horns, and hence he was called Dhul Qarnayn. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Another point that I'd like to mention is that last, last night we talked about Dhul Qarnayn building a wall. قالوا يا ذا القرنين إن يأجوج ومأجوج مفسدون في الأرض فهل نجعل لك خرجا؟ Can we give you money to build us a wall to build us a dam? تجعل بيننا وبينهم سدا سدا means a dam or a wall a huge wall in between two mountains. 
To protect us from who? Magog. Gog and Magog, as they're known in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Ya'juj wa ma'juj. Where is this wall? If we're speaking geographically, where is this wall? Here, there's also a couple of opinions. One opinion says it's the wall of China. It's the wall of China. Because the Chinese, they had to deal. Why did they build a wall? To protect themselves from invaders. They built a huge wall. That wall was built by Dhul Qarnayn. But this, is, this theory is false. It's inaccurate. Why? Because number one, number one, the wall of China does not fall in between two mountains. Remember yesterday? We said that the wall that Dhul Qarnayn built fell in between the edges of two mountains. Bayna Sadafain. We mentioned this yesterday. Between the edges, two edges of two mountains, Dhul Qarnayn built a wall. The wall of China extends for several kilometers. So it can't be the wall of China. This is one. Two, the wall of China is not made of iron. Because yesterday, Atuni Zubar al Hadid, he told them, bring me bricks of iron. While the, child, the wall of China is not made of iron, nor is it made of copper. So this is not correct. Another theory says that the dam that was built by Dhul Qarnayn is the dam of Mi'rib, which is a modern day Yemen. And it existed, and uh, historically it existed at the time of Seba. Seba was a great civilization in Yemen. And one of their queens is mentioned in the Quran. What's her name? Bilqis, Sheba Bilqis is mentioned in the Quran. Perhaps not by, by name, but by her qualities. She's mentioned in the Quran. Allah tells us how smart she was, how brilliant she was, how diplomatic she was. And she saved her, her country, she saved her people from the devastation of war. You know, when they say that a woman cannot be a president or a ruler, the Quran gives us an example in Surah an naml of a female that ruled in great diplomacy and she saved her family or she saved her country from the devastation of war. طيب. So some say it's the dam of Mi'rib which is in modern day Yemen. However, there's two problems with that. One, that dam is also not made of iron and copper. Two, it's a dam to protect the city from water, to collect water. That, that's why we have dams today in, in America and other places. To collect water in one area and to protect the below city from being drowned by that water. It wasn't to protect them from invading armies, but to protect them from water. Ayatullah Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi in his Tafsir al-Amthal is of the opinion that this dam or wall that was built by Dhul Qarnayn is in the area called Al-Quqaz in Arabic. In English, it's called the Caucasus or the Caucasus, Caucasus, right? And it's an area in between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And this area includes Azerbaijan, Georgia, and modern-day Armenia. You know, there was a, a war between George, um, Armenia and Azerbaijan, that area known as Al-Quqaz. The dam is over there. There's a, there's, it's a mountainous area and there's a narrow pathway and there's a wall, there's a dam in that area. That pathway is called Daniel or Daniel. The path of Daniel and there's a dam over there and that dam was built by Dhul Qarnayn. This is an opinion held by Ayatollah Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi. Tayyip. As for Ya'juj and Ma'juj, yesterday we mentioned that they're from Mongolia. Al-Allama Taba Taba'i in Tafsir al-Mizan, he gives a bit more detail. He says that in North Asia, there were barbarians, Al-Mughul, which are from Mongolia. These people were, were barbarians, they were fighters, they would invade neighboring countries, they would go out, they would pillage villages, cities, nations and they'd invade and they'd put their own rulers 
in these cities. They'd have local rulers ruling on their behalf. But they would go and destroy those cities. They would kill, they'd destroy the men, take advantage of the women, and so on and so forth. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they would pass by in a, in a narrow path in between mountains and come to these poor people who asked Dhul Qarnayn for help. And the Mongolians, they did, they committed a major crime against Muslims when during the era of the Abbasid period where they attacked where? Iraq, the fall of Baghdad at the hands of the Mongolians and it was led by Chinggis Khan. Chinggis Khan led the attack on modern day Iraq and Baghdad, Baghdad fell to the Mongolians it fell to the Mughul. So this was one of the things that they did to modern day, uh, to, to, to Muslims during the Abbasid period. So Ayatollah Nasr Makarim, he says that these people, they attacked Al-Quqaz and who happened to be there and they asked him for help? Kurush, King Kurush, who was known as Cyrus the Great. They told him, listen, come and build us a dam, come and build us a wall to save us from Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So these were a couple of points, historical points that I wanted to clarify regarding the story of Dhul Qarnayn. And at the end of the day, these are theories. I'm not saying, they, I'm not saying this as facts. They're, they're theories. And any of them could be proven right. Wallahu al-alim. At the end of the day, we don't know. Allah Azza wa Jal knows the truth. Now, before I conclude, just briefly, I want to touch upon a couple of lessons that we may learn from the story of Dhul Qarnayn that we talked about yesterday. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا We gave him from all resources. فَأَتْبَعَ سَبَبًا And he made use of those resources. And this is a lesson for us because sometimes Allah gives us the resources but we don't make use of them. We don't make use of them. It could simply be a masjid that we don't make use of it. And then Allah tests us like he did during the pandemic for a year and a half. Our mosques were empty and we regretted keeping our mosques empty. We would yearn to have one Salatul Jum'ah. One, just once, be able to come back to the mosque and see our friends and, and family members back at the mosque. But for a year and a half, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took that ni'mah away. And this is part of, this is normal. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a ni'mah and we don't realize how great, you know, how great that ni'mah is, if we're not grateful, Allah takes it away. This is how it works. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is how we, He gives us a ni'mah. We don't appreciate it. He says, you know what? Give it, give it back to me. Dhul Qarnayn made use of the resources. This is very important. This is number one. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Dhul Qarnayn went to the far east, remember, wajada qawman, qulna ya Dhul Qarnayn, imma an tu'adhiba wa imma an tatakhida fiyam husna. Oh, Dhul Qarnayn, you either punish them or you reward them. Of course, it doesn't mean that it was up to Dhul Qarnayn whether he wanted to punish or reward. No. The Quran was telling him, Allah was telling him that reward the good and punish the bad. And this is how you start a government. This is how you set up a government. This is how you establish law. Good citizens, you reward them. You let them off of certain things. Less taxes, less punishments. But for the evildoers, have to be punished. Otherwise, it'd be chaos. Imagine if we lived in a country and a government where the good and the bad, they were treated equally. There's no prisons, there's no jails, there's no tickets. There's no punishment. That'd be chaos. That's the law of the jungle. That's how animals live. They eat, eat the strong, the, 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 the strong eat the weak. And there's no law. There's no punishment. Allah tells him, to punish the, the, the evildoers and reward the good. And then he says, And then he says, 
Al-Husna. طيب. Another lesson that we could learn from the story of Dhul Qarnayn is that remember when he went to the far west. This was in the far east. When he went to the far west, وَجَدَ قَوْمًا لَا يَكَادُونَ لَا يَكَادُونَ لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ قَوْلًا he went and saw a group of people that cannot speak. Remember, we, we talked about this yesterday. And we said, what does that mean? They cannot speak. Do they literally cannot speak? Or do they speak another language? Or do they not understand his culture, his civilization? What is it? One of the opinions was that they cannot speak. But yet, but yet, Dhul Qarnayn listened to them. Although he had difficulty understanding them, they couldn't speak. Yet, Dhul Qarnayn gave them his ear. And this is how a leader is. He gives his ear. He listens. He listens to people. He listens to those in need. He listens to those who need him. From different classes, from different nationalities, from different groups. He gives a listening ear. That is what a good leader does. He listened to them. He listened to their problem and he tried to fix their problem. A hadith by Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. He says, Isma'u al-asammi min ghayri tasa'urin sadaqatun hani'a. If you try to listen to the mute. The mute. They can't speak. But they try to converse. If not vocally with sign language. Attempting to listen to the mute. This is a charity. This is an act of charity. So those with disabilities, when we help them, someone who can't speak, we try to understand what they say. This is an act of charity. The Al-Qarnayn gave a listening ear to those who he could not understand. He didn't speak their language. Another lesson that we learn is that safety and security is above everything. Those people who asked the Al-Qarnayn for help, they had money. They had money. They told them, we will pay you to build us a dam, to build a wall. But there was something that they did not have. What is it? Safe, safety. Security. What good is it that you have all of the money in the world, but when you put your head to sleep, you can't sleep safely. You can't sleep in, in security. At any moment, you're afraid that someone will attack you. Invaders will attack you. Someone will attack you. A thief or... Ni'matul am. This is the greatest of all gifts to know, to feel secure, to feel safe. And Dhul Qarnayn helped them feel safe. Tayyib. Another lesson that we learn from the story of Dhul Qarnayn is that when those people, they asked him for help to build them a wall, he didn't say, okay, you guys could go ahead, go back, sit, relax, and watch me build the wall. What did he say? He said, No, you come and participate as well. You want help? Come, I'll help you. But you also have to help yourself. You can't just expect help from others while you sit back, relax, and you enjoy being helped. You have to also participate. You have to participate. And when you participate, you will realize that you help yourself. You were part of the contribution, right? I remember visiting a community. They have a beautiful mosque. They have a beautiful mosque, but they didn't build it. Someone came and he built the mosque for them. And that community, some members, some of the members did not appreciate that mosque. Why? Because it was handed to them on a silver platter. Had they also participated in building that mosque, they would have appreciated it. When you don't participate in the, in the achievement, when you don't participate, you don't appreciate it. And thus it, it goes from you. You might lose that achievement. You have to participate. If you have an issue and you seek assistance from someone, you have to expect to participate in that achievement. You have to participate in that work. That's how it works. Whether it's a country seeking assistance from another country or a family seeking assistance from another family or an individual seeking assistance from another individual. You also have to make an effort. Dhul Qarnayn could have told them, okay, you guys could go back and watch me build the wall. He said, no, I don't want your money, but I want your labor. Come and help me build the wall. You have to participate. 
You have to participate. طيب. صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد. Another lesson we learn from the story of Dhul Qarnayn is that any civilization, no matter how backward they are, they can rise. They can rise on their feet. That civilization, they, they, did, they couldn't speak. And we mentioned yesterday that when a group of people cannot speak, it shows you how poor they are. Not poor financially, but poor intellectually and educationally, that they can't even speak. Or they knew how to speak, but their culture was backward. Their civilization was backward. Yet even those people who are, who are being pillaged every day by Ya'juj and Ma'juj, that backward civilization, they were able to rise. They were able to rise because they were determined. And they had the right guide. You see, when you have the right guide, someone to come and guide you, no matter how backward you are, no matter how behind you are, no matter how low you can get. But if you have someone who can come and guide you and you have the right program, right? You had a, you had a program for them. He said, bring me iron and put those bricks of iron on top of each other. And then bring me wood and fire and copper and all of that. They had a set agenda. They had a set program. Everything was fine. And then after that, they slept comfortably. Ya'juj and Ma'juj never attacked them again. Their women were saved, their children were saved, their economy was saved. And just yesterday they were attacked repeatedly. This shows that even if you're in the worst case scenario, there's always hope. There's always hope that you can rise to be above. You can change your situation. And Allah tells us, Allah does not change the status of a people lest, lest, they have the desire to change. They are determined to change. They have a strong will to change. Allah will help them change. This is a lesson for all countries, all nations, all groups of people, all cultures that we can rise. We, can we should never say that, you know what, we will never change. My people will never change. My country will never change. No, we can. If we are determined, if we have the right guide and we have the right program, we can change. Another lesson we learn from the story of Dhul Qarnayn is that a, a righteous leader, a good leader does not ask for financial gain. When they told him, هَلْ نَجْعَلُ لَكَ خَرْجًا Let us provide you with money but build us the dam, build us the wall. What did he say? مَا آتَانِ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا Allah has given me more than you can provide me. I don't need your money. I will do I will build the wall for you. I will build the dam for you for the sake of Allah. فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ مَا مَكَّنِّي فِيهِ رَبِّي خَيْرٌ What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me is better than you could offer me. What is it that you want to offer me? How much can you offer me? Allah has given me 10 times, 20 times, 100 times more than anything that you can offer me. This is how a righteous leader does. Helps people for the sake of Allah. Not expecting anything in return and this is what makes Dhul Qarnayn who might not even have been a prophet as we saw there were narrations some of these narrations were contradictory some say he was a prophet other narrations said he wasn't even a prophet but an entire page in Surah Al-Kahf immortalizes Dhul Qarnayn for his sincerity he didn't ask anything in return also after he built the wall another lesson after he built the wall, after he saved this people from being attacked by Ma'juj and Ma'juj, by these invaders, he said, This is a mercy of my Lord. He didn't say, this is my accomplishment. Remember this next time in four years. You know who, who to elect. You know who's your president. Who? None of this. None of this. This is the job of politicians. This is what politicians do. Dhul Qarnayn, after he finished all of this, he said, Hada rahmatu min Rabbi. This is from my Lord. I was nothing. I was only, you know, a intermediary, a wasla that Allah used for him to build you the wall. It wasn't me. He doesn't ascribe anything to himself. He doesn't take credit for anything to himself. Unlike us, unlike us, we take credit of other people's work, let alone our work. When we do something, we boast about it and we steal other people's credit. While Dhul Qarnayn doesn't even take credit for his own work. 
من ربي finally finally ذو القرنين teaches them a lesson that yes now that we've built you a fine wall a fine dam no one can attack you any longer no more invaders rest assured however don't be fooled don't let arrogance take you don't think that this wall will exist forever and remain forever there will come a day in which even this strong wall made of iron and copper this wall will also be destroyed we human beings unfortunately as soon as we have an accomplishment an achievement we feel a bit strong we become arrogant we become arrogant the quran says surely man becomes arrogant when he sees himself to be independent he thinks he's invincible untouchable he becomes arrogant didn't we learn a lesson just recently during the pandemic didn't we hear from someone that this is the greatest economy on earth this economy is untouchable every day in the news the stock market this the stock market that the economy this the economy the greatest economy in the world what happens God sends him a virus that cannot be seen even can't be seen with the naked eye destroy the economy everything collapsed within minutes within hours within days the economy began to collapse never feel arrogant this is a lesson no matter how powerful we become economically militarily politically never assume that this is going to stay forever no one remains in power forever no one remains powerful forever everyone at some point will have to kneel other than Allah Azza Allah is the one that doesn't kneel everyone else kneels before Allah Azza I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our a'mal during the holy month of Ramadan. May Allah accept from you your fasting, your prayers, your dua. Tomorrow we cash in, not by the gifts that we receive. Hopefully some of us receive good gifts, but that's not what I'm talking about. We cash in on the day of Eid, for the a'mal that we've done. Six nights of Laylatul Qadr, Dua Joshan al Kabir, Rafa al Masahif, the Ziyara, the A'mal. I know some of you, God bless you, you were here till Fajr on those six nights. And I saw the parking lot, it was full during those six nights. Tomorrow we cash in, not with financial gifts, but with the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal. On a night like this, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Sallam says, إِذَا كَانَتْ لَيْلَةُ الْعِيدِ If it was the night of Eid, نَادَى مُنَادٍ أَيُّهَا الصَّائِمُونَ اِغْدُوا عَلَى جَوَائِزِكُمْ An angel will come, Allah will send a special angel on the night of Eid. He will say, oh, the ones that fasted. If you fasted this month, you're lucky. You're lucky. If you fasted the entire month. O oh, you who fasted, go quickly tomorrow and receive your gift. And then he says, It is not the gifts of kings or emperors passing out gold and silver. The gift is that we are released from hellfire. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to release us from hellfire and to grant us Jannah. نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العلي الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا عيبا إلا سترته ولا خوفا إلا آمنته ولا رزقا إلا بسطته ولا شملا إلا جمعته ولا مرضا إلا شفيته ولا غائبا إلا حفظته وأدنيته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة لك فيها رضا ولنا فيها صلاح إلا قضيتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين أعوذ بجلال وجهك الكريم أن ينقضي عني شهر رمضان أو يطلع الفجر من ليلتي هذه 
ولك قبلي تبعة أو ذنب تعذبني عليه. Thank you to the dedicated brothers and sisters at the MIC. May Allah bless you. May you continue to grow as a community. May Allah bless each and every single one of you. Thank you for listening to me for the past two weeks. Forgive me if I offended anyone in my lectures and my statements. <clears throat> May Allah bless you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.